you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in the first verse, the Bible says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Revive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted, excuse me, receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said, therefore, that we, that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am, I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by, con by, by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrow, sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For the godly, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be with thy people here at Dover, God. We give you great praise for that. Lord, we praise you for a church that will stand truth in dark times. God, we pray this morning that you would bless your word. Lord, that you'd stir it up uh, to our hearts. Lord, that you'd give us great consolation. And we would be uh, faithful to give you the praise and the glory. And the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, I'm going to be preaching this morning on a sorrow that is gifted by God. Now, a sorrow that comes from God is just not sorry. Like you do something offensive and you apologize and say, I'm sorry. A, sorry, uh, a sorrow gifted by God is brings you grief, brings you, uh, brings you a, 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 a sorrow that is inward and that is uh, something that is uh, hurtful to the soul, and that's a rare thing in the day which we live. And, and so if salvation is to come and if redeeming even of the saved is to come, sorrow has to prelude that. Now, I want you to see back in the uh, first verse, the Bible says, Having therefore these promises. So which promises is he speaking of? The, the Bible is rich in promises. It's rich in, in the word that it's get, that he's given us. So uh, look back just a bit to see specifically what promises he speaks of. Uh, first of all, in 16, uh, excuse me, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, he says, What agreement had the temple of God with idols, for ye are the temple of God. Now we have we have no uh, business. We have no, uh, no nothing to obligate us. Nothing to do uh, with idolatry because our bodies are better than that. This is what we use to serve God. 
This is what we use to please God. We live in a flesh that is difficult, difficult to control, but by the hand of God, it's not impossible to control. And we live in a day and age where people cop out on sin by saying this flesh is an impossibility. Now, it cannot be saved, but it's not given you to sin in. We have to live in something. We have to serve God in something. And this is what we have so it's to be used for the Lord. It's not to be destroyed by sin and reveling in sin and uh, he gives us some fair warning so we are to use this wherefore come out from among them and he just said uh, he, the means the ones that are around us the idolaters the, the people that do not love God where come, wherefore come out from among them among them and be ye separate saith the Lord. Now, I want you to know that it, uh, it's a twofold thing. Number one, it says, saith the Lord, and he is quoting a, a portion of scripture from the book of Isaiah. So the Lord God, Jehovah, and he's renewing it in the ministry of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to serve him. We are to give him great glory. We are to give him honor every time that the, that the opportunity presents itself in this body. It's not, uh, it's not such a hindrance that it can't be accomplished. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I, the Lord Jesus Christ, will receive you. Now, I want you to see, he says, uh, touch not the unclean thing. Now, you think about everything that's going on around us in the modern day. We are not to be identified with it. We're not to touch it. Where's your stand on abortion? That is not a choice. That is murder. That is not something that we are to be have a, if you know one candidate is supporting that mess, you run for your life. Get away from it. We are not to be involved in that in any means whatsoever. Think about that. And, and then I want you to see that also if, uh, if, if, uh, Someone is involved, even in your own family, with abject, open sin. Come out away from them. Do not identify with them. Do not get interested in what they have in their lives. We are to be a separate people. Verse 18. And will be a father unto you, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ will be our fatherly figure. He'll give us guidance. He'll give us He'll give us direction and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters and the uh, saith the Lord Almighty. Again, this is not coming from Paul. It's coming from God. Now, a lot of uh, falsehoods will, will advocate that Paul was, being, Paul was being Pope here and said, you come to me. But if you look at your Bible, he's really quoting from Jeremiah. And God Almighty is the one that he's speaking of. So considering all of this, considering that this is where his promise to receive us lies at, he begins having therefore these promises. That, that is what we need to consider. If you want to consider this chapter in its entirety, consider it on the terms of him having fellowship with you. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, so he acknowledges their salvation, he acknowledges the church, he acknowledges who they are. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Now, listen, that ought not just to make the candlelight run the aisle, and it shouldn't make the Pentecostal people turn their somersaults, that's for us. Cleanse the filthiness of your flesh. That's our responsibility, man. We don't like to hear that, do we? And you know why? Because it grows to holiness. And we don't like it. Notice the next thing it says. Cleanse our flesh and our spirit. Now, a lot of people again will say, see, there you've got to save yourself. But notice 
what that is. It, it, it's little f spirit. It's not the soul of man. It doesn't say cleanse, <laughs> cleanse your soul. Your spirit. You ever met somebody, no matter when you see them, no matter how you see them, they always got a horrible attitude. And it's just like when you go in, like Eeyore, that, that the whole cloud comes in there with them and just brings everybody down. That's their spirit. That, that's who they are. That's what they carry around with them. And you know what? If you have that character that's discouraging and cynical and judgmental, you need to get rid of it. Cleanse yourself from it. Get, you know, toss it, toss it far from you because that is not where the child of God ought to be. And it says right here, we're commanded, cleanse yourself from that. Get rid of it. From all... And, uh, from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting or completing or polishing holiness in the fear of God. Now, listen, in the, in the flesh, we have no motivator to do this. In the flesh, we have no desire whatsoever. We love the flesh. We enjoy the flesh. We like what the flesh has to offer. But I want you to say, he says at the end of it, in the whole in the spirit. Now, now notice what it says. It, it, it is in the fear of God. Do you fear God this morning? You know, just because He's our Savior and Redeemer, that don't mean we ought not to, to fear Him. You know what this book says? It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we don't fear Him, if we don't, if we don't uh, take a take some note of who he is and even realize to the point he can take our life in an instant, then we don't fear God. So if you have no other motivator, the spiritual motivator of fearing God or to drive us to that, and that's what he wanted. Why? Because of the promises. Verse 2, he says, receive us. You receive the word of God? Do you take it for exactly what it says and as though it was authored by the pen of God himself? Receive us. Do you receive the thoughts and the, and the recommendation that Paul was inspired to give us? Receive us. When preaching hits the wrong way, do you receive it? That's what we're commanded to do. You, you want to be formed into this person that, that 2 Corinthians 7 calls us to be? What that begins is, is receiving the Word of God as though it is indeed the very Word of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. And we have defrauded no man. Now, uh, Brother Jared, you, you look at that real care carefully. He says, I've corrupted nobody. You know what that says to me? Me and you can corrupt people and teach them erroneously and teach them some things that are not true, and then we'll be held accountable. Yeah. He says, I've not corrupted any of you. I've not taught you any false ways. And this way of, uh, of controlling your flesh, I'm not corrupting you in that either. I speak not this to condemn you, for I've said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. In other words, he had a great burden for the church at Corinth. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. A lot of people say, uh, you know, uh, uh, people say I'm kind of loud as a preacher and I'm direct. You know, that, that's not how I perceive myself, but I do perceive myself as bold. I, I believe that's being faithful, do you not? When, when you know what, if uh, in, in my in my carnal position as a nurse and somebody falls out and, and like, well, I don't know. I really don't feel like doing CPR today. Uh, I'll go over there in a minute. You wouldn't want that, would you? No, because you know what? It comes to the preserving of the flesh. <laughs> Why would we give anything different in the spirit? Move on it. Be quick. Go to it. And, 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 and be commanding in the things of God. And that's what Paul was saying. I, I Listen, I, I, 
I am zealous because it's you that I'm dealing with. I'm zealous because it's of a spiritual matter. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. In other words, this church has made unbelievable progress. I am filled with comfort. You know, what, what a wonderful thing when when uh, when you think of your church and you're just comforted by, by how good God has been, how progressed they have come. Uh, when we lay someone out here in the cemetery, are you comforted or troubled? See, the only way to receive comfort, comfort when, when you bury somebody is that you're pretty confident they knew the Lord. Uh, that's the only comfort you can have because listen, you're going to miss them and there's nothing to take care of that. I speak from experience. There, there's nothing that's really going to soothe that except if they knew the Lord. And that's what, and, and so he's saying here, uh, you're a comfort to me. I am exceeding joyful in our, notice he, he shared it with them. He says it belongs to you at Corinth and it belongs to me, our tribulation. You know what? Uh, tribulation comes. You know what? If you're having a, a big woohoo time and you have 50,000 coming and, and, and it looks like a rock concert down there, where's your tribulation? Right. It ain't none. It ain't none. Amen. And, and so we find then that Paul says, I'm there with you. I'm praying with you. I took ownership of it unto myself. I'm in your tribulation. Verse 5, for, we, for when we were come unto Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, and, uh, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Uh, you ever been fear, uh, fearful to stand up for what is right? I have. <laughs> you know, uh, think about Jared when he left the church there at Paris. You know what? You did it for the right reason. And I bet you were fearful. It wasn't a big church, but it probably was a little money. He has a big family to feed. But sometimes you just have to do what's right. And the Lord will bless you for that. The Lord will, will take you will take you through situations like that. And, and so he says, I was fearful on the inside. I wasn't sure to stand up for this or not, but he knew God would have him to do it. Nevertheless, God that com that comforted the comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. You ever had that when it's just a knock on the door? Or somebody says Hey, what's going on today? And it's all you needed to hear. That that comes from God. Titus came and gave him a report and said, Hey, listen, uh, they're going through a lot down there, but God's being faithful. They're being faithful to the Word of God. They got that fellow out that was running around uh, with his stepmom. They throwed him out of the church. And man, it was great comfort to them. You know, we, we need a report like that. You know, that's how mission letters ought to be. Not, give me, give me, give me, my name's Jimmy, but rather God's doing great things. Even when no one is, the Lord's saving no one, we've been sustained, and we're still here, and God is still blessing, and we're being faithful to the Word of God. That's good news. That, that, that's wonderful, wonderful things to be going on. So he says, listen, that report from Titus did me a lot of good. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation where he, where he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire. Now we find something then that goes back to controlling this flesh is your desires. What is your desire this morning? What, what, what is the desire of your spirit to continue like you are or to serve him more and more and more and more as the day goes on? That He says, listen, I was comforted because I know what you want. Your mourning, meaning over sin, uh, your, fre your fervent mind toward me. 
so that I rejoice the more. So, though I may be sorry. You ever had a sermon that made you sorry? You know, where that always comes from is, is conviction from the Holy Ghost. Because listen, you can't be made sorry of yourself. Another thing you can read in the Word of God and say, hey, I've not been doing that. Uh, I've not been faithful to that. I've not been, uh, I've been struggling with that. Well, put your flesh in shape. Uh, put your flesh down a little bit. Get it a little bit more under control. And he says, I'm not worried about that. I'm glad I did it. Uh, for though I make you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but a for a season. Now, you ever uh, get mad at the preacher and then go home and think about it a little while? Compare what he said to the Word of God and realize he was right and you're wrong? See, that's repentance not to be repented of. That, that, that is aligning yourself with the Word of God. Now, I want you to see that Paul wrote to them and said it was just a season. You, you know what that is? That's a season of repentance. But after the season of repentance comes a season of great joy. Uh, of nearness unto the Lord, uh, of being thrilled in the Spirit, being close unto the things of the Lord. If you've not experienced that at the sound of preaching, you better check yourself out. You better be certain that you have what you uh, think you have. You know what? There, there's about three responses to preaching I have found in nearly 30 years of ministry, and this is it. You'll receive it, you'll reject it, or it means nothing to you. One of the three. And the rejection and the receiving both come from children of God, believe it or not. The only one that doesn't come from the children of God is the one that means nothing. He that have an ear, let him hear. And if you don't have ears, you can't hear and so we find that the child of God can be rebellious. And it's this flesh right here. This is the trouble. He says, I want you to get this in control. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you, that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye, for ye were made sorry after a godly man. Now that is, the, that, that is the key to repentance. That is the key of getting this flesh where it needs to be. That is the key is the godly repentance. Now we look at those two words and the first word godly, well, I mean it doesn't take a rocket scientist. If it's godly sorrow, when's it coming? It has to be God, don't it? You, you, you don't get that out of somebody telling how good you are. It's a gift of God. It, it comes from God. A godly repentance. Now, repentance is not preached on much in the uh, uh, modern day, but repentance comes down to this, is picking things out of your life individually and saying, I'm sorry for that, Lord. I know I messed up. I know I didn't look right. I know I didn't act right. right. I should not have said that to that fellow. Forgive me, that is godly repentance. That is repentance that will put you back in line in sweet fellowship with the Lord. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to re be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, a lot of people will jump on that and love a works-based salvation. But notice those last two words. The, the kind that worketh uh, to death. See, that word means exactly what it, what it presents to be. It means that you'll die. It means you'll be cast off into hell. See, uh, it can also work like this too. 
If it's not the godly kind, he'll take you out. It's pretty scary, isn't it? You say, well, I, I, I don't believe God would do that. I don't believe that he would approach it that way. <laughs> but there's a lot of people you need to consider. What about Lot? Do you think Lot was saved? Well, the Bible says he was, does it not? Just a lot. Do you think he was, do you think he was rebuked of the Lord? Do you think he was judged of God? Sure he was. Down there having youngins with his own daughters. Dad begging to be back in the mode of sin. Remember what he said about that city? It's just a little one. We, we just want a little sin, don't we? If I have to leave this big city of Sodom, Gomorrah, that is, that is full of sin, let me go with just a little sin. <coughs> you know what? This is the thing. If you're that much out of the will of God, it's full of sin. It, it don't have to be overthrown like Sodom and Gomorrah was. Just a tiny little bit will, will take you in the wrong direction. And so we find then that this godly sorrow is an unusual thing in the modern day. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew very quickly. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, uh, the first sermon that we're aware of that is spoken of in the New Testament that's well recorded. Notice what it says. Matthew uh, chapter 3 in the first verse, the Bible says this, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, his message was twofold. Number, number one, you repent. And, and, and number two, he sets a timetable on it and says, For the kingdom of God is coming. You know what? The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Repent ye. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left. Listen, things look pretty bad right now, don't they? But you know what? They can go worse than they are today. We, we, we think, we was talking about this the other day, that we can't fathom what's happening today. I, I mentioned that Wednesday night. Can you imagine when this, this one right here is about 40? You know what? I can't imagine it. I know now for sure from what I have seen in my 50 years, I know I can't imagine what that young man will see on my grandchildren. Right. I have no idea. Mm. And so we find then that, that uh, he said, listen, the Lord's coming. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I hope it's soon. And he repeat, preached repentance. Verse 3. For this, meaning John, is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle, and you can find the girdle in the temple about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all of Judea, and the region round about Jordan and baptizing of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Why is that significant? It was repentance. Saying, yeah, I've done wrong. And for these folks, I'm no longer honoring the Jewish law. I am adding stuff that I know's not there. That's confessing. That, that, that is getting right. That's why washing your hands three times during the meal, listen, it was, just, it was never there. It, it was not part of the law. And so these people getting right with the Lord began confessing specifically what they had not done. Uh, a little further over, Matthew 8. Matthew 8 in the first verse. Uh, the Bible says, When he come down, and that was from the Sermon on the Mount, 
And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Now, a lot of that is they were wanting something of him. It was not genuine compassion. It was not genuine repentance. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. Now, notice that the, the hinge here that it swung on was this, is that he understood the power of God. Do you understand the power of God? Sometimes I'll have to say sincerely, I cannot fathom what he's able to do. I, 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 it's, it's beyond this pitiful little mind of mine to even consider the greatness of our God. But he knew this one thing, and it was one, one revealed truth. If you want it, I know it can happen. You know what? That's a pretty big truth in of itself, ain't it? If he wants to crawl, if he wants to uh, split the ri River Jordan or the Red Sea, you know what? He's still able to do it. If he wants to take that bunch out at San Francisco, uh, that Jezebel, that's their senator, and wants to open the the world, wants to open the earth and swallow her up like the infidel she is, you know what? He can still do it. <laughs> You ever thought about how to explain that way if God and His goodness decided to do something like that? Man, they'll come up with something, won't they? Yeah. Uh, the St. Ho's story will be flying. But you know what? That, that's under God's control. Still can do it. <laughs> Any moment, any time he wants to, he's still able. He, he can still get the job done. And you know what? When we see something like that, don't view it as a tragedy. Rather view it as the mighty hand of God at work. And so this little leper knew what he was talking about. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, shew thyself to the priest, offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, so now he went from the mountain into the city, that little leper uh, uh, interrupted his walk, and now he's inside the city. There came unto him a centurion beseeching him. Now two opposite end of the pole. One little beggar leper, the only way that they could uh, get any help was some, what they give him because they were rotten him from the inside out. And now we have a man in great authority. A man that uh, was part of the Roman occupation. Full of sin, but yet full of authority. And saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. I've often wondered about that tormenting. If it was a devil or if it was simply a palsy, which one that it actually was. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and he I will come and heal him. The centurion, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Man, you talk about understanding the power of God. Understanding that it's all under his feet. Understanding, listen, we don't have to do nothing. What was the command? Teach, preach, teach. Jared, that's all you have to do. Let, let the rest of it go. I don't have to have a big band up here. I don't have to beg nobody. It's all under his feet. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing as you sit and think about it this morning? And, and this little centurion, uh, no doubt he was Roman. No doubt he, 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 he must have been high up in the ranks, but yet he understood the character of God and he understood what repentance was about. 1 Corinthians 2, Paul writing, the first letter to the church of Corinth that didn't go as easy as the second one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. In verse 13, the Bible says this Which things also we speak, 
not in the words which man's wisdom dwelleth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, have you ever wondered why some people just can't get it? Now, back in my younger ministry, you know, I wanted to convince people of what I believed. You know what? That's not my job. That's the world of the Holy Ghost. You ever wonder why people can't see a doctrine as pure and simple as election? Well, I can tell you this. It's because they've not been convinced of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Very simple. Are you the Holy Ghost? No. So how could you possibly convince them of that? It's an impossibility, is it not? You know what? You can get all the head knowledge you want, and if you don't have a spiritual thimble full of knowledge, you know what? It will be no comfort to you whatsoever. When trouble comes, you'll be just as tore up as the next one, wringing your hands and wondering what's going to be next. Well, I can tell you what's going to be next in this world and the world to come, and that's the very thing God ordained for today. And it's an enjoyment. It, it, it's a good thing. It's a glorious thing. And, and so we find then, as uh, Paul is writing, he says, huh, I give you something. I, I, I provided you something that, it, that, that is of great, great importance, and that is the Holy Ghost. Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, the Holy Ghost, <laughs> The, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them except they be spiritually discerned. You know what election is about? It's spiritually discerned. You know what come out from among them and be separate is about? It's spiritually discerned. You know what train your children up in the way that they should go comes from? Uh, it's spiritually discerned. Until Adam was five years old, I didn't even know what homeschooling was. I didn't even know you could do it. You know what? The government wants to convince you that you can't do it. I will guarantee you that. They want them over there if they can get them and brainwash their little heads. Mm -hmm. and, but I want you to see, when, when, when I learned of that, man, I was convinced of the Holy Ghost. Well, this is what we need to do. This is the direction our youngins need to go. And, and, and so we find then that uh, don't bang your head against the wall. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't stress about it because the convincing comes from the Holy Ghost and the spiritual encouragement comes uh, by the Holy Ghost and repentance comes by the Holy Ghost. You can preach sin and preach sin and preach sin, but if God doesn't give gift Repentance, it will not come. It will not come. And so we find then that that is where we, as the Lord's people, ought to be. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. The Bible says this, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Think about you uh, Russellites with that. that. That's what they do. They say he is not God, but he is. Of God calleth Jesus accursed, that no man can say Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Sounds like a revealed truth to me, don't it you? Sounds like it's not something we can conjure up in the flesh. It don't sound like anything that two plus two make four. Brother Jerry was talking about that old boy, and I'm sure he meant it sincerely. Uh, said, uh, salvation is the easiest thing you'll ever do. Well, here it says it takes the moving of the Holy Ghost. That's something totally different, is it not? You, you know why people like that doctrine? They want to preserve this flesh. That's why they like it. But it ain't going to happen if the Holy Ghost ain't involved. It ain't going to happen and unless uh, the Holy Ghost comes down and makes a great move of His people. It's simply not going to happen. And so we find then 
if you're teaching anything else, you got to repent of that. Second Kings, we're going to look at things that approach your life, and then we're going to close. And you think about, because I don't know, uh, you think about how you handle problems in your day. Second Kings 19 and verse 10, we find a man that knew about repentance. That was uh, in, a, in a world of hurt. 2 Corinthians 19 and verse 10. The Bible says this, speaking of Israel's enemies, thus, ye, thus shall you speak to Hezekiah. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thy trust trusteth, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem will not be delivered unto the land, to the hand of the king of Assyria. Has God ever deceived you? Certainly not. He's truth in the very essence of truth. He has never, ever deceived you. Behold, thou hast heard, now listen at the world's report, Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and, sh and shall thou be delivered? Now, I want you to now see uh, what the results of sin is. It's always to destroy. It's always to take things down. It's always to, re always to, to obliterate. And he says, you look around you, Hezekiah, and you see the flatlands, and you see the cities destroyed, and the very same thing is going to happen to you too. Have the gods, little g gods, the things that those heathens worshipped, have the gods of thy nations delivered them, uh, which my fathers has destroyed as Goshen and Haran and, Re and, and Rispa and, and the children of Eden, which were in uh, Thelazar? Where is the king of Hamath? I can tell you where he was. He was dead. And the king of Arpad. And the king of the city of Zephyrim, and of, uh, of Hena and Iphan and Ipha. Where were they? They were dead. Every one of them taken out of the map. When they attacked the city, they took the leader too. And you know what? That's what the devil wants you to believe. Listen, in this in this situation, listen, when everything is breaking loose and nothing seems right anymore, you know what? The devil wants you to dwell on that. But let me let me say this: God is still on the throne. He doeth what seemeth well unto himself. And you know, the only reason that Nancy Pelosi is where she is at right now is because God wants her there. And I don't understand it, but you know what? I don't need to understand it. All I need to do is trust God. Amen. That's all I need to do. And, and so we see this big scary scene was thrown out before Hezekiah and, and wanted to end the work of God. Verse 15, And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art God. See, he recognized God. He understood God was sovereign. And he understood, hey, it may go down. But God's still God. It, it, I may be wiped out, but you're still God. Even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth, every bit of it. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. You ever had to pray that? Look like I listen to the whole gig is up. And it's easy to talk about sovereignty in these four secure walls, isn't it? But when you get out there and say, listen, you're about to, if you don't give it up, things are we're gonna take your children. That's a whole different thing, isn't it? Whole whole different thing. Listen, you ain't gonna get no food unless you do what I say I say you're gonna do. Whole different thing, isn't it? It's easy to shout about it within the security of these four walls. But when it comes to application, you know what? I need to pray. Hezekiah understood said, hey, God, you're sovereign. I understand that. But listen, I need to pray. I need to lay it out before you. I need to understand. I'm coming to you in repentance. 
I need you. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou alone of the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow, not, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which have sent him, sent him to reproach the living God. Now, I want you to see that in addition to knowing, listen, they're going to wipe us out. He reminds God of this. He says, listen, they're not just after us. They want to embarrass you too. They want to bring down your name. They want to run her through the mud because you've promised peace to Israel and they want to take it away. You know what? He, he's promised sustenance to us. Now, don't get too excited because I, I, I've heard of God's people starving to death, haven't you? But there's a spiritual sustenance there, isn't it? There's bread we can feast on. There, there, there's things that we can understand and know. And, and, and so we find, we, we find in this that he, said, he, he says, remember your promises. Remember what you have committed to us. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou art alone, all the kingdoms of earth thou hast made, heaven and earth. O Lord, now, O Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which have sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, these kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. They, he acknowledged the enemy. Have you ever acknowledged the energy of your flesh? That's the enemy, is it not? If, you're, if you've been saved, have, uh, have you acknowledged uh, the power of Satan? Have you acknowledged who he is? That's what Hezekiah did. And cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore thou, they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art God, and God even thou only. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, that thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and I have heard. What a, what a wonderful thing. Ever wondered why your prayers are hindered? Now, I don't think y'all are much different than me, but sometimes I pray and I don't think it's got anywhere. I want to know that I've heard. And if you're not, find the problem. Mm -hmm. Repent of it. And there'll be great victory. You know, you know why Hezekiah had such a great victory? Read a little bit before that. That Hezekiah repented. When he saw trouble coming, he knew he wasn't right. And he knew he had to get right. And then when the threat was literally in his face, he went back down to the house of God. Wonderful thing, isn't it? We need to do that.